Graph is easily one of the data structures a lot of people have problems with. I agree, it is a little bit complicated. But the difficulties that you are facing, that are often because you are just trying to learn up a concept without even trying to understand what all real life situations this data structure can solve. All the traditional data structures that you know about, stacks, queues, linked list, they cannot even be applied to some of the advanced problems a graph data structure can easily solve. So that is what I want to focus on. I want to go slow and build up a solid foundation so that you can easily understand all of the underlying concepts that are constituted within a graph. Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I just want to give you a basic overview about what a graph is and how do you apply this data structure to one of the real life problems that you will have absolutely seen. We will also go over some of the basic terminologies associated with this data structure and we won't be writing any code in this video. I just want to make sure that you make your foundation solid first. So without further ado, let's get started. Let us do a quick recap on some of the basic data structures that we already know about. Primarily, data structures can be divided into two parts, linear data structures and non-linear data structures. Among the linear structures, you already know about arrays, stacks, queues, and if you want to go crazy, link list as well, right? But if you notice, in all of these structures, the elements are arranged in a linear fashion, correct? Even in a link list, although the nodes can be anywhere in the memory, when you're traversing them, you always go in a linear fashion. You have to encounter one after the other. That is why all these data structures are called as linear structures. Among the non-linear structures, we know about trees. In a tree, you have a root node and then you have a left child and a right child. You choose where to go. If you go on the right, once again, you have two choices. That is why this is a non-linear data structure. On the left, you can have just one node and on the right, you can have another whole bunch of tree. In this category, we have one more type of data structure and that is a graph. So in a graph, once again, you have all these nodes and they are connected via edges similar to your trees, right? But you do not have any rules over here. For example, in a binary tree, you can only have two children for every node, right? But that is not true for a graph. In a graph, let us say I am looking at this particular node. Then it can have any number of neighbors. For example, this has one, two, three, four, and five. This particular node has five neighbors. Looking at this particular node, it only has two neighbors. So this is a very basic idea about what is a graph data structure and why do you call it a nonlinear data structure? You can start anywhere and you can end anywhere. You can start from over here and then traverse like this. You can start from here and then traverse like this. You can start from here and then traverse like this. It is all up to you. And this is a property of the graph that we take a lot of advantage of. Now, you had all of these data structures. Why did we need this additional data structure? Why make our life so hard? So to understand this, let us take up an example. Okay, so I give you a task that design a very, very, very basic version of Facebook. So what happens in Facebook? You have a profile and then you have some details, correct? So what you can say is, okay, I will make some sort of an array or some sort of a list, correct? And in this list, okay, I will mention that, okay, this is my profile name and I can store all of my personal info. This can be a list or it can be a string array, right? Since you have to make it Facebook, then there can be a lot of different people as well, right? So for every new user who will try to sign up, what you can do is you can once again create different, different lists or different arrays, right? So you can have user two, user three, user four, and user five. And for all of these users, once again, you can store all of your personal information in some sort of list or some sorts of arrays, correct? So this is how you can start, right? Now what happens? What is the first feature of Facebook? That is friends, right? And now I tell you that, okay, 
person one is friends with person two and person four. So if you want to just use the data structures that you have, what you can do is that, okay, I will mention that person one has person two and person four as their friend. So you maintain this information over here. And now similarly, person two is friends with person one and person three. So you are getting all of this information, right? And you can just try to store all of it. For this particular scenario, let us say person three is friends with person two, four and five. Person four is friends with one, three and five. And person five is friends with four and three. So this is how you are storing certain kind of a model for your Facebook, right? This is very, very, very basic. And you can also say that, okay, since I am making some sort of a network, I can just connect all of these nodes. And that is how maybe you took advantage of your linked list data structure, right? Because at any moment, someone can just delete their account or someone can add a new account. So a linked list gives you all of that flexibility, right? You can just get rid of this account and maintain your entire network. So that is how things can go ahead, correct? Everything is good for a moment. And then you have to add a new feature that you are adding pages to Facebook. So someone can like a different page and someone can like a different page. So let us say that person one wants to like another page. So what you can do is that, okay, I will add this information. And now since it's a network, let us say person four also likes that page. You can have multiple pages, right? Let us say person five likes page two and since a person can like multiple pages, you may say that, okay, person one also likes page two. So far, you have been able to take the advantage of your lists, correct? If you want to look at the profile of person one, you can say that, okay, this is his basic information. These are his friends and they like these pages, right? Similarly for person four and person five. So you are able to give all of this information very, very easily, right? Now the problems start to get a little bit tricky. What happens if you want to know that, okay, how many people like page one? What will you do now? You do not have this information straight away. What will you do? You will start iterating. You start from the very first profile. You see that, okay, one of the members like page one. Then you go to your second profile. They do not like to your third profile. They do not like to your next profile. They like this page and this last profile. They also do not like page one. So you traverse the entire list and found that, okay, two people like page one. Similarly, if you want to know how many people like page two, once again, you will traverse everything and then say that, okay, two people like page two. So you are seeing what problems we may face. Let us say you have a lot of people joining your network now. And if I ask you that, okay, how many people like page six? Once again, you will have to query everything and then tell me that, hey, these many people like page six. And if you want to perform any calculation, let us say that person four no longer likes page one, then you will remove it. And if you want to know, okay, how many people like page one, once again, you will traverse the entire list and then determine that, hey, only one people like page one. So now you try to understand how the problem is getting tricky and tricky. If you have a lot of pages, then this information is hard to maintain. And since you always want to grow, there can be new features as well. Let us say now you want to add the functionality of photos. So what do you do now? You start adding photos to each profile. And what happens in a network? All your friends can like each other photos, correct? So once again, I ask you, okay, how many friends like the photo one? So once again, you will have to iterate through all of your profiles because you will be storing all of these information in each of the profiles, correct? So this is where you see that adding new and new features gets very, very tricky. I know that you won't be designing Facebook actually in this way, but just try to understand that just by using the data structures that you know about, you cannot find an efficient solution. Yes, you will be able to answer those queries, but we want something very efficient. So that is where you need the help of some other data structure that we have not used up until now. What we now do is take up all the information that we have and instead of making lists or something else, what you now do is 
create a node for each of the individual that is trying to join Facebook. Correct? All of these nodes, they are representing each individual profile. And what information do you have? You know that person one is friends with two and four. So what I'm doing, person one is now connected with two and four, right? Look at person two. Person two is friends with one and three. So person two is friends with one and three. Look at person three. Person three is friends with three people, two, four and five. Just look at this node. This node is connected with two, then four and then a five. So that is what we're doing over here. This graph is easily capturing all of the information about how everyone is linked together. Do you remember how we added pages and photos to our network, right? So once again, let us say you're using graphs and now you want to add that same functionality of a page. Instead of adding to all of these individual profiles, what you can do is you can now create an additional node. And now this node represents the page. If you remember, person one likes this page, so I will connect it. And person four also likes this page. So that is how you can extend your network. Similarly, let us say you have one more page. And page two was liked by one and five. So this is how you are gonna keep on updating your network, or you can say that you are gonna keep on updating your graph. Now try to ask the same questions. How many of the people like page one? You do not have to iterate this entire list, right? Just look at this node and just see how many edges it has. It has two edges. That means two people like page one. How many edges does page two have? That means two people like page two. If you remember, we removed one connection, right? Let us say person four no longer likes page one. Now, how many people like page one? Just look at this node and look at its connection. You only have one connection, so one person likes page one. So you see, how are we making our calculations so efficient? In our previous implementation, you had to iterate your entire network just to determine that, okay, only two people like page one, only one people like page one. With this graph data structure, you can just analyze these nodes and determine that, hey, only one person likes this. Similarly, if you want to add photos, let us say I add a photo and this photo is owned by person three, but some of his friends like the photo too. So once again, you will create connections. Now you want to know how many people like this photo. Once again, just look at this node and find its edges. You have three edges. So you can say that, okay, three people like this photograph. So you see, how this graph data structure helps you to answer all of these real life problems. That how many people like this photograph? How many people have retweeted this? This is all of this information that gets stored in a graph data structure. And that is why understanding a graph data structure is very, very helpful when it comes to solving real life problems. To go over some of the basic terminology, you have now seen how a graph actually looks like. So I'm going to take this particular example. As you know, all of these nodes, they are called as vertices and all of these connections, they are called as edges. So for this particular graph, you have five vertices and you can define them like this to find all of the edges. You define them in this particular way. So this is telling me I have an edge between one and two. And that is right over here. My next edge is two comma three. So this is right over here. My next edge is three comma five. This is right over here. And similarly, you have all of these remaining edges as well. This is how you define the vertices and edges in a graph. And this is the most common implementation that you might have already seen. That is how you write or represent a graph. G equals to V and E, where V and E are all of your vertices and edges. This is the most common notation. I bet you have seen at all the places, correct? Moving on, I want to discuss three basic terms that you will hear again and again. Let us say I have this sample graph with me, correct? In this graph, what are adjacent nodes? For example, in an array, you have an element. So the element to the left and to the right, they are its adjacent elements. 
when it comes to a tree, you have a node and then you have its child nodes. So both these nodes are their adjacent nodes, correct? In a graph, if you look at this first node, then its adjacent nodes are two and four. You will not call one and three to be adjacent nodes because they are not connected directly. Similarly, when you look at this particular vertex four, you have three adjacent nodes, one, three, and five. Two will not be an adjacent node to four. So that is how you represent and determine all of the adjacent nodes in a graph. The next term that you will often hear is path. So a path can be any path that is defined between two nodes in a graph. For example, a path can be one, four, three, and five. It can also be one, four, and five. So it can be any random path as long as these nodes are getting connected. It will never be possible that you cannot reach any node in the graph. So that is how you might have seen that there are a lot of problems. Okay, find the shortest path. For example, if you look in this graph, if you have to reach node one from node three, so either you can take this path and this can be the shortest or you can go to first five, then four and then one. So this is a long path. So that is how the word path comes into play. The next term that you must be aware is a directed graph. Usually in a graph, when you have edges and you don't see any directions, this is a non-directed graph. If you have defined edges like this, then this becomes a directed graph. It means that you can go from one to two, but you cannot go back from two to one. This is prohibited. And this is what a directed graph and an undirected graph actually means. I hope this video gave you a very basic overview about what a graph data structure actually is. As per my final thoughts, I believe that you might have a question in your mind that, hey, isn't tree also some sort of a graph? You have all of these nodes that are connected by these edges, right? So to answer your question, yes, every tree is a graph, but every graph may not be a tree. But more on that later. As of now, while going throughout the video, did you face any problems? Tell me everything in the comment section below and I would love to discuss all of it with you. As a reminder, if you found this video helpful, please do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This motivates me to make more and more such videos where I can simplify programming for you. Also, a huge shout out to all the members who support my channel. This really keeps me going. Stay tuned and I will bring on more and more lectures on graphs. Until then, see ya.